Story seven of Wounds in the Rain War Stories by Stephen Crane. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story seven Virtue in War Parts one through three. One Gates had left the regular army in eighteen ninety, those parts of him which had not been frozen having been well fried. He took with him nothing but an oaken constitution and a knowledge of the plains and the best wishes of his fellow officers. The Standard Oil Company differs from the United States government in that it understands the value of the loyal and intelligent services of good men, and is almost certain to reward them at the expense of incapable men. This curious practice emanates from no beneficent emotion of the Standard Oil Company, on whose feelings you could not make a scar with a hammer and chisel. It is simply that the Standard Oil Company knows more than the United States government, and makes use of virtue whenever virtue is to its advantage. In 1890 Gates really felt in his bones that if he lived a rigorously correct life, and several score of his classmates and intimate friends died off, he would get command of a troop of horse by the time he was unfitted by age to be an active cavalry leader. He left the service of the United States and entered the service of the Standard Oil Company. In the course of time he knew that if he lived a rigorously correct life, his position and income would develop strictly in parallel with the worth of his wisdom and experience, and he would not have to walk on the corpses of his friends. But he was not happier. Part of his heart was in a barracks, and it was not enough to discourse of the old regiment over the port and cigars to ears which were polite enough to betray a languid ignorance. Finally came the year 1898, and Gates dropped the Standard Oil Company as if it were hot. He hit the steel rail to Washington, and there fought the first serious action of the war. Like most Americans, he had a native state, and one morning he found himself major in a volunteer infantry regiment, whose voice had a peculiar sharp twang to it, which he could remember from childhood. The colonel welcomed the West Pointer with loud cries of joy. The lieutenant colonel looked at him with a pebbly eye of distrust, and the senior major, having had up to this time the best battalion in the regiment, strongly disapproved of him. There were only two majors, so the lieutenant colonel commanded the first battalion, which gave him an occupation. Lieutenant colonels under the new rules do not always have occupations. Gates got the 3rd Battalion, four companies commanded by intelligent officers who could gauge the opinions of their men at 2,000 yards and govern themselves accordingly. The battalion was immensely interested in the new major. It thought it ought to develop views about him. It thought it was its blankety-blank business to find out immediately if it liked him personally. In the company streets the talk was nothing else. Among the non-commissioned officers there were eleven old soldiers of the regular army, and they knew, and cared, that Gates had held commission in the 16th Cavalry, as Harper's Weekly says. Over this fact they rejoiced and were glad, and they stood by to jump lively when he took command. He would know his work, and he would know their work, and then in battle there would be killed only what men were absolutely necessary, and the sick list would be comparatively free of fools. The commander of the 2nd Battalion had been called by an Atlanta paper, Major Ricketts C. Carmony, the commander of the 2nd Battalion of the 307th Blank, is when at home one of the biggest wholesale hardware dealers in his state. Last evening he had ice cream, at his own expense, served out at the regular mess of the battalion, and after dinner the men gathered about his tent, where three hearty cheers for the popular major were given. Carmony had bought twelve copies of this newspaper, and mailed them home to his friends. In Gates's battalion there were more kicks than ice cream, and there was no ice cream at all. Indignation ran high at the rapid manner in which he proceeded to make soldiers of them. 
Some of his officers hinted finely that the men wouldn't stand it. They were saying that they had enlisted to fight for their country. Yes, but they weren't going to be bullied day in and day out by a perfect stranger. They were patriots, they were, and just as good men as ever stepped, just as good as Gates or anybody like him. But gradually, despite itself, the battalion progressed. The men were not altogether conscious of it. They evolved rather blindly. Presently there were fights with Carmony's crowd as to which was the better battalion at drills, and at last there was no argument. It was generally admitted that Gates commanded the crack battalion. The men, believing that the beginning and the end of all soldiering was in these drills of precision, were somewhat reconciled to their major when they began to understand more of what he was trying to do for them. But they were still fiery, untamed patriots of lofty pride, and they resented his manner toward them. It was abrupt and sharp. The time came when everybody knew that the Fifth Army Corps was the corps designated for the first active service in Cuba. The officers and men of the 307th observed with despair that their regiment was not in the Fifth Army Corps. The colonel was a strategist. He understood everything in a flash. Without a moment's hesitation he obtained leave and mounted the night express for Washington. There he drove senators and congressmen in span, tandem, and foreign hand. With the telegraph he stirred so deeply the governor, the people, and the newspapers of his state, that whenever on a quiet night the president put his head out of the White House he could hear the distant, vast commonwealth humming with indignation. And, as it is well known that the chief executive listens to the voice of the people, the 307th was transferred to the 5th Army Corps. It was sent at once to Tampa, where it was brigaded with two dusty regiments of regulars, who looked at it calmly and said nothing. The brigade commander happened to be no less a person than Gates's old colonel in the 16th Cavalry as Harper's Weekly says, and Gates was cheered. The old man's rather solemn look brightened when he saw Gates in the 307th. There was a great deal of battering and pounding and banging for the 307th at Tampa, but the men stood it more in wonder than in anger. The two regular regiments carried them along when they could, and when they couldn't, waited impatiently for them to come up. Undoubtedly the regulars wished the volunteers were in garrison at Sitka, but they said practically nothing. They minded their own regiments. The colonel was an invaluable man in a telegraph office. When came the scramble for transports, the colonel retired to a telegraph office and talked so ably to Washington that the authorities pushed a number of corps aside and made way for the 307th, as if on it depended everything. The regiment got one of the best transports, and after a series of delays and some starts and an equal number of returns, they finally sailed for Cuba. 2. Now Gates had a singular adventure on the second morning after his arrival at Atlanta to take his post as major of the 307th. He was in his tent, writing, when suddenly the flap was flung away and a tall young private stepped inside. "'Well, Mage,' said the newcomer genially, "'how goes it?' The Major's head flashed up, but he spoke without heat. "'Come to attention and salute.' "'Huh?' said the private. "'Come to attention and salute.' The private looked at him in resentful amazement, and then inquired, "'You ain't mad, are you? Ain't nothing to get huffy about, is there?' "'I come to attention and salute.' Well, drawled the private as he stared, seein' as ye are so darn particular, I don't care if I do, and if it'll make your meals set on your stomach any better. Drawing a long breath and grinning ironically, he lazily pulled his heels together and saluted with a flourish. There, he said with a return to his earlier genial manner, how's that suit ye, mage? There was a silence which to an impartial observer would have seemed pregnant with dynamite and bloody death. Then the major cleared his throat and coldly said, 
And now what is your business? Who, me? asked the private. Oh, I just sort of dropped in. With a deeper meaning, he added, sort of dropped in in a friendly way, thinking you was maybe a different kind of feller from what you be. The inference was clearly marked. It was now Gates's turn to stare, and stare he unfeignedly did. Go back to your quarters, he said at length. The volunteer became very angry. Oh, you needn't be so up in the air, need ye? Don't knows I'm dead anxious to inflict my company on yer, since I've had a good look at ye. There may be men in this here battalion what's had just as much education as you have, and I'm damned if they ain't got better manners. Good morning, he said with dignity, and passing out of the tent, he flung the flap back in place with an air of slamming it as if it had been a door. He made his way back to his company street, striding high. He was furious. He met a large crowd of his comrades. "'What's the matter, Lige?' asked one, who noted his temper. "'Oh, nothing,' answered Lige, with terrible feeling. "'Nothing. i just been looking over the new major, that's all.' "'What's he like?' asked another. "'Like?' cried Lige. "'He's like nothing. He ain't out in the same kittle as us is. No, God made him all by himself, separate. He's a special product, he is, and he won't have no truck with just common men like you be. He made a venomous gesture, which included them all. Did he set on ye? asked a soldier. Set on me? No, replied Lige with contempt. I set on him. I sized him up in a minute. Oh, I don't know, I says as I was coming out. Guess you ain't the only man in the world, I says. For a time, Lige Wigwam was quite a hero. He endlessly repeated the tale of his adventure, and men admired him for so soon taking the conceit out of the new officer. Lige was proud to think of himself as a plain and simple patriot, who had refused to endure any high-soaring nonsense. But he came to believe that he had not disturbed the singular composure of the Major, and this concreted his hatred. He hated Gates, not as a soldier sometimes hates an officer, a hatred half of fear. Lige hated as man to man, and he was enraged to see that so far from gaining any hatred in return, he seemed incapable of making Gates have any thought of him save as a unit in a body of three hundred men. Lige might just as well have gone and grimaced at the obelisk in Central Park. When the battalion became the best in the regiment, he had no part in the pride of the companies. He was sorry when men began to speak well of Gates. He was really a very consistent hater. 3. The transport occupied by the 307th was commanded by some sort of a Scandinavian who was afraid of the shadows of his own topmasts. He would have run his steamer away from a floating Gainsborough hat, and, in fact, he ran her away from less on some occasions. The officers, wishing to arrive with the other transports, sometimes remonstrated, and to them he talked of his owners. Every officer in the convoying warships loathed him, for in case any hostile vessel should appear, they did not see how they were going to protect this rabbit, who would probably manage during a fight to be in about a hundred places on the broad, broad sea, and all of them offensive to the Navy's plan. When he was not talking of his owners, he was remarking to the officers of the regiment that a steamer really was not like a valise, and that he was unable to take his ship under his arm and climb trees with it. He further said that them naval fellows were not near so smart as they thought they were. From an indigo sea arose the lonely shore of Cuba. Ultimately the fleet was near Santiago, and most of the transports were bidden to wait a minute while the leaders found out their minds. The skipper, to whom the 307th were prisoners, waited for thirty hours halfway between Jamaica and Cuba. He explained that the Spanish fleet might emerge from Santiago Harbor at any time, and he did not propose to be caught. His owners, whereupon the colonel arose, as one having nine hundred men at his back, and he passed up to the bridge, and he spake with the captain. 
He explained indirectly that each individual of his nine hundred men had decided to be the first American soldier to land for this campaign, and that in order to accomplish the marvel it was necessary for the transport to be nearer than forty five miles from the Cuban coast. If the skipper would only land the regiment, the colonel would consent to his then taking his interesting old ship and going to H with it. And the skipper spake with the colonel. He pointed out that as far as he officially was concerned, the United States government did not exist. He was responsible solely to his owners. The colonel pondered these sayings. He perceived that the skipper meant that he was running his ship as he deemed best, in consideration of the capital invested by his owners, and that he was not at all concerned with the feelings of a certain American military expedition to Cuba. He was a free son of the sea. He was a sovereign citizen of the Republic of the Ways. He was like Lige. However, the skipper ultimately incurred the danger of taking his ship under the terrible guns of the New York, Iowa, Oregon, Massachusetts, Indiana, Brooklyn, Texas, and a score of cruisers and gunboats. It was a brave act for the captain of a United States transport, and he was visibly nervous until he could again get to sea, where he offered praises that the accursed 307th was no longer sitting on his head. For almost a week he rambled at his cheerful will over the adjacent high seas, having in his hold a great quantity of military stores, as successfully secreted as if they had been buried in a copper box in the cornerstone of a new public building in Boston. He had had his master's certificate for twenty-one years, and those people couldn't tell a marlin spike from the starboard side of the ship. The 307th was landed in Cuba, but to their disgust they found that about 10,000 regulars were ahead of them. They got immediate orders to move out from the base on the road to Santiago. Gates was interested to note that the only delay was caused by the fact that many men of the other battalions strayed off sightseeing. In time the long regiment wound slowly among hills that shut them from the sight of the sea. For the men to admire, there were palm trees, little brown huts, passive, uninterested Cuban soldiers, much worn from carrying American rations inside and outside. The weather was not oppressively warm, and the journey was said to be only about seven miles. There were no rumors save that there had been one short fight, and the army had advanced to within sight of Santiago. Having a peculiar faculty for the derision of the romantic, the 307th began to laugh. Actually, there was not anything in the world which turned out to be as books describe it. Here they had landed from the transport, expecting to be at once flung into line of battle and sent on some kind of furious charge, and now they were trudging along a quiet trail lined with somnolent trees and grass. The whole business so far struck them as being a highly tedious burlesque. After a time they came to where the camps of regular regiments marked the sides of the road, little villages of tents no higher than a man's waist. The colonel found his brigade commander, and the 307th was sent off into a field of long grass, where the men grew suddenly solemn with the importance of getting their supper. In the early evening some regulars told one of Gates's companies that at daybreak this division would move to an attack upon something. "'How'd you know?' said the company, deeply awed. "'Heard it. Well, what are we to attack?' "'Dunno.' The 307th was not at all afraid, but each man began to imagine the morrow. The regulars seemed to have as much interest in the morrow as they did in the last Christmas. It was none of their affair, apparently. "'Look here,' said Lige Wigworm to a man in the 17th Regular Infantry. "'Whereabouts are we going tomorrow, and who do we run up against, do you know?' The 17th soldier replied truculently, "'If I catch the blank, blank, blank what stole my terbacker, I'll whirl in and break every blank, blank bone in his body.' Gates's friends in the regular regiments asked him numerous questions as to the reliability of his organization. Would the 307th stand the racket? 
They were certainly not contemptuous; they simply did not seem to consider it important whether the 307th would or whether it would not. "Well," said Gates, "they won't run the length of a tent peg if they can gain any idea of what they're fighting. They won't bunch if they've about six acres of open ground to move in. They won't get rattled at all if they see you fellows taking it easy, and they'll fight like the devil as long as they thoroughly, completely, absolutely, satisfactorily, exhaustively understand what the business is. They're lawyers. All except in my battalion." End of section 10